one thing that we do know about humankind is that we are resilient. There are always exceptional people amongst us who can turn something bad into an opportunity. And it's my pleasure to not only introduce everyone here to some exceptional people, but I'm delighted to say that they are all women. Well, oh, hello, I hear no applause. They're all women. Come on, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so joining me is Marta Belcher. She's the president of the Filecoin Foundation. Welcome, Marta. Next up, we have Democrat Mikey Sherrill from the US House of Representatives. Welcome, Mikey. And then last but not least at all, we have Sasha Ustinova. She's a Ukrainian MP. Ladies, welcome. Should have changed shoes. Okay, it's such a pleasure to, of course, have all of you here, and I think all the audience is going to be fascinating because these women are absolute change makers. Okay, well, let's kick off um, this chat then. So, Sasha, I'm going to come to you first because you did something that is pretty exceptional. Now, of course, as a politician, you believe in public service and justice, but lobbying Congress... <laughs> and she knows where I'm going with this one. 37 weeks pregnant. So that's basically, she was literally ready to have her baby. She lobbied Congress because when the war started, she found herself, I think, with your husband in the US. She couldn't go back. So talk us through why you decided that was what you needed to do at that time for your people. And what sort of results did you see at that moment? Well, honestly, I accidentally happened to be in the US when the war broke. And I remember I told my husband to get me the first flight to DC, and he was like, now? I was like, yes, now. I'm flying there now. And he was like, what are you gonna do there? Like, I don't know yet, but we definitely need to do something to help Ukraine. And uh, uh, it, took, it took me a month. It was my last month of pregnancy. I didn't expect it was gonna be this way. Uh, to go over Congress, talk to everybody I could, to all the senators, all the Congress people, asking them for more support and weapons. And because we still keep saying that the best humanitarian aid for Ukraine is weapons, because otherwise we couldn't stand up against Putin and his regime. And I remember everybody was making fun of me, asking if I'm going to deliver soon in Washington, D.C., or I'm going to do something. I was like, you know, if you give us more weapons, I can deliver on the Senate floor somewhere else, but we just <laughs> need some serious stuff to protect ourselves. And it did help, because uh, I was telling everybody, my baby needs to go home. And that's to go home, we need to win this war. And when she was born, uh, I was really afraid that something could have happened because I was stressed all the time. I was crying every day because my best friends were dying there. And um, that's, that was the least I could have done. And when she was born, we named her Victoria because we needed a victory. And I believe it's gonna, we're gonna get there eventually, sooner or later. I don't know, it's gonna take months or years. But um, I think it did change uh, some attitude and it did help because now I remember when we started asking for the air defense system at the beginning, it was very tough. But now we do get those from the United States. We have the Bradley machines that we could have dreamt about. And I was telling everybody on the Hill that one of the popular names in Ukraine for the babies today is Javelin. They didn't believe me, so I did call our Minister of Justice and I told them, can you send me the official report? So it's really cool to name Anna Javelina or I don't know, Elena Javelina. This is very popular. And the popular name for the uh, uh, dogs now is Heimers. And uh, that's why when people understand how important it is for us, how it, they, it was a game changer actually, getting all those Javelins, all those Tingers, Heimers, and now Bradleys. And now Ukraine is not fighting for our own independence, we're fighting for the free world. Can I also ask you, um, obviously when you, when you started this, you, when you decided to lobby Congress and, and to do what you needed to do for your country, obviously for your unborn child, um, is there a difference now in the way, because what we've really, all of us have seen through this war is this resolve, this bravery of Ukrainian people, the willingness to never give up. So do you think now, I mean, obviously at that moment when you were, of course, lobbying, it was perhaps unusual for US politicians, perhaps Mike, you could come in. Was it unusual to see this sort of level of lobbying that was coming from, from people like Sasha? Um, but now I guess it's a bit more commonplace because we have this really great dynamic between obviously um, DC um, and Kyiv. So it, it was unusual at that time. In fact, um, most people might be hard pressed to remember that the first time we impeached President Trump, 
it was because he was yes. withholding <laughs> Sorry, I munitions from Ukraine. Yes. And, and I don't know that, that a lot of people recall that that was the crux of why many of us in the national security space um, felt it was necessary to impeach the president. He was withholding these munitions because he was trying to force Ukraine to manufacture evidence against the Bidens. And, um, and that was, you know, crossing a red line. But at that time, I, I think I remember, um, you know, coming to this decision and, and speaking to some people and saying, oh, and where is Ukraine? You know, I don't think anyone now says that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it, and it's in large part um, because of the, the incredible efforts of the Ukrainian people. And I would just say it's not simply on the battlefield. We have um, what we would call shuttle diplomacy on the hill from Ukrainians um, back and forth in the middle of a war to come over to the United States when I'm sure the last thing, as you've heard, they want to do is leave their country, but to come and advocate passionately. Um, and we've also seen, I think, a, a president, President Zelensky, who has, has met this moment in such an amazing way um, and used um, new technologies to reach out to people in a in a way we haven't seen. And, and speaking of this sort of new technologies He's panel. He's also changed the way amazing. we see politicians, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for the better. And um, But this is a, the, the Ukrainian people, um, you know, thank you, Sasha, for speaking so kindly about the munitions that, that the United States has worked to provide for you. But I would call the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian soldiers the ultimate MacGyvers. Right. Because they have taken what we've given them not always exactly what they've asked for, but they have found ways to utilize it in new and inventive ways. And I always remember when I was in Ukraine a week before, about a week before Russia invaded, I was speaking to people on the ground um, and it, it was really remarkable how high tech and innovative the country was. Um, and speaking to someone in the tech field saying, you know, there's a lot the United States could learn from Ukraine. The United States doesn't feel as nimble to me in the tech sector as, uh, as Ukraine does. And that is certainly reflected in the military. I, I, I would say as somebody who works closely with our military as a veteran, I would say the nimbleness and the inventiveness and the innovation that we've seen from the Ukrainians is truly amazing. And Mikey, just so everyone understands your background as well. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about, but I want everyone to understand exactly who these fantastic panelists are. So you've had years in the Navy. You've seen war, I think it was the Iraq war. Um, you retrained then as a lawyer. You worked in the US Attorney's Office. You then of course run for office. So tell us a little bit more about yourself as well before we obviously go on to the lovely Marta. Um, and how has your background really shaped the sort of support that you want to see provided from your country to Ukraine? So I would add to that bio the, the crux of why I fight so hard for the future and why this is also important to me. And that's because I also have four kids. And I will tell you that among our youth, um, it started to feel several years ago as if we had not imparted to our young people um, the same strong faith in our democracy and our values. And we were seeing um, young people who didn't seem to have that same sense um, of connection to our democracy. And I'll tell you, I remember um, under the previous administration, my county executive, who's, who's roughly my age, a little bit older, said to me, you know, we have this program for young people, for new immigrants, and there was um, this young woman who um, had come over from another country, had gotten citizenship, had, had, was um, at Yale, and she was doing a summer internship for my county, with my county executive, and he said, well, what do you want to do? And, and really, this is somebody who traditionally in the United States of America, we would have regarded as the American dream. And the sky's the limit, right, with Yale and, and, and what she could have done. And she said, I don't know. Maybe I'll go to France. No way. That was it. That was where young, that's what young people were feeling a couple of years ago. And so when you hear that Ukraine is fighting not just for their own democracy, but for democracy across the world, 
the illustration and the reminder of the gift that we have at home that people are now dying for in the face of Russian aggression, I think has truly been a reminder of those core values and has shown our children um, what a gift our values are to them. Really, really well said. Um, and so, Marta, I mean, you know, to bring you in on this idea of, you know, democracy and values, I mean, obviously, you're not someone, a young person who just wanted to go to France. You're a pioneer on crypto and civil liberties and tech that really helps people to communicate, especially in oppressive regimes. So tell us all about you, why you're so passionate, you know, and also what the Filecon Foundation is doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Filecoin um, is really, I think the way to think of it is Airbnb for file storage. So if you have extra storage space, you can store it on store uh, other people's files on your computers, and you'll be paid in Filecoin. Um, and if you want to store your files on other people's computers, you pay them in Filecoin. So that sounds like niche use case. Why do we need that? Well, the reason we need that is that today's internet and so many of our technologies are centralized. And what that means is you'll, you'll see, for example, Amazon Web Services go down, and these vast swaths of the web go down for hours. What having a centralized internet model means and what having to live your lives through just a handful of corporations means is that fundamentally you really end up in a situation where information can go down at any time, where information can be surveilled, by anyone, whether it's your government or another oppressive government, um, and really where users are not in control of their own data or security, where you have to rely on these intermediaries to protect your civil liberties. Um, and so for me, it's so important to build this decentralized version of the web. Um, we really see Filecoin as this sort of foundational technology for the next generation of the web, which is decentralized, where instead of having your files and your data stored by just a few centralized intermediaries, you're in control of your data. There are many copies of that data stored all across the world in different places, and the availability of that information isn't dependent on any one server or company. And why does that matter? Well, that matters when, for example, um, to give you one example, when you have video evidence of war crimes that someone might want to make disappear. Um, that matters when, for example, a war breaks out and suddenly, um, let's say you're in Russia, suddenly you're a dissident, right? And you need to make sure that you're not living your life through intermediaries that are going to hand over your data to the government. Um, so for me, Fundamentally, the thing that Filecoin is trying to do is build a more decentralized web and build the next generation of the web where you can really ensure security, privacy, and civil liberties. And so, Marta, you, you touch upon there how you're evidencing um, war crimes. Can you give us a sense of the size of the data that you're working with? I mean, this is a massive mammoth task. Yeah, so we have, um, so we, we actually do a ton of work um, uh, across various different human rights use cases in order to preserve this data on the Filecoin network and make sure that it gets preserved into the future. Um, so one project is uh, the Starling Labs, um, and that is a project of Stanford and the USC Shoah Foundation, um, and they are really preserving massive amounts of war crimes data, genocide survivor testimony, and other things that you want to be able to both make sure is preserved into the future and also be able to cryptographically verify has not been tampered with. Um, and so that is a massive amount of data. We also work with different um, organizations like the Freedom of the Press Foundation to document uh, evidence of, for example, press freedom violations um, and other humanitarian data that gets stored on the Filecoin network to preserve it into the future. Um, and when you actually look at the storage capacity of the Filecoin network, um, it's humongous um, because it turns out when you create a storage network that's decentralized using this incentive system, using the Filecoin cryptocurrency to actually um, incentivize people to contribute their data to the network, you end up with a huge amount of storage space. Um, we actually have 19 exabytes of storage capacity, okay. which to put that in, in sort of perspective could store all of the written works of humanity from all time, from the beginning of recorded history to today, <laughs> 20 times over. Fantastic. Yeah, we represent about 1% of global storage capacity digitally, which wow, is just wow. humongous. Um, and we're really using that storage capacity to preserve humanity's most important information, which is our mission. 
Well, so, Sasha, how important is for you as a Ukrainian to be hearing all of that from Marta? Well, I'm very impressed, and I, honestly, all of the help we're getting uh, worldwide in starting with crypto and ending with helping us with the storage and uh, even filing and documenting these war crimes, this is something we couldn't have done by ourselves. Um, I just had a conversation with uh, Marta's colleagues on the crypto, for example, and you know, uh, I was telling them the story how Ukraine never actually cared about crypto. It wasn't that popular. So we okay. did work a lot ourselves, but we didn't have any legislation or regulation on that. But, you're, but, but, but this sort of tech revolution hasn't started overnight. So take us through it then. You say that you weren't looking at crypto, but take us through how you've been, been, been doing it then. So uh, basically it was outsourcing. It was, doing, it was basically outsourcing, but for example, we started thinking about regulating crypto when we saw our uh, MPs, and we had a lot of young MPs coming uh, in the last uh, session to our um, uh, parliament, actually declaring their assets in crypto. And everybody was like, wow, how do we calculate it? How do we know how much they have in their assets when they came to the parliament and how you can track if they're not corrupt, if That's they're not getting corrupt? I'm just thinking myself, I mean, for anyone here from whichever country you're from, think about your politicians actually doing that. It's unheard of, like, sorry, carry It on. was very unlikely, but when the war broke, uh, we actually uh, had a special fund who, that accepted cryptocurrency, and we had managed to buy uh, a lot of stuff for the army, including some armor and weapons, uh, UAVs, uh, rifles, everything that could have been bought just because people donated in crypto. And once we started doing that, we actually managed to organize the system that now you, you need one minute for verification through your cell phone so you can get that or you can donate it. And it is very easy, it's very uh, comfortable, and the best thing is it does support Ukrainians. It supports humanitarian, it supports our army, and we, we are open saying that we are probably one of the first countries to run it in a very short period of time and do everything needed just because we needed it to survive. <laughs> and and in, a, in wartime, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite unthinkable in some ways about the innovation that's going on um, within your country. Um, now, on I, throughout the day today, in earlier panels, people have been talking about this idea of digital equity. So do you think this transformation that your country is going through in wartime can actually bring that? I mean, you've got so many different platforms, and I think it's called DIA, where you're becoming a country of entrepreneurs. That's what I was saying about yes, one-minute exactly, registration. Yeah. Yes, it, so it's, it's, it's really quite fascinating. But, I mean, obviously, you know, all of this transformation is fantastic, but on the other side is what, of course, Russia is doing. It is bombing and, and, and just, just trying to destroy whole cities. So how is that equity then possible? Or perhaps is equity only possible when thankfully this war will actually end? Honestly, I think we should all admit that Russians are not only fighting Ukraine, but they are fighting not only the free world, but industry and development. And basically they're saying that um, quantity is better than the quality because we have more advanced weapons, they have many more people dying there on the battlefield. Basically what they're saying is, it doesn't matter that Ukraine has transformed just for everybody to understand, we don't need a passport right now, you just go on your cell phone, you have your driver's license, you have your passport, your COVID certificate, everything needed for the for internally in the country and some of the countries have already admitted it. Uh, and But Russians basically what they're saying, it, it, it all doesn't matter. All that matters is how many people you have there going with the rifles to die for. And uh, I think Ukraine will prove that it's more important to be uh, smart, industrialized, it's more important to be advanced than just to have the number of people fighting in your army. And this is, I think this is something that uh, not only Ukrainians should understand, but the world has to understand because we are fighting for basically what the industrial revolution was about. What about, we have the new technologies. We're fighting for technologies and not only the number of people you have in the army. And again, we as Ukrainians are ready to share a lot of the things we had done on our side because I remember there was a really good article in the Wall Street Journal recently that we had developed better software than NATO has to work with the army and we are ready to share that. And I think we will have a lot of things to share with the world when the war ends in, the, in terms of technology especially. So Mikey, could you perhaps clarify that? Does Ukraine really have better, better software than, than, than NATO has? 
Th that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, <laughs> Ukraine has not um, a fan of NATO. <laughs> this, this is well. This is really if you know if you go to Kiev now, this is really the first modern war. Um, and by that I mean air raid sirens are come over your cell phone, yep. much like in the United States we'd get an amber alert. Um, you see. Um, when you go to the sites um, of Russian atrocities, they have already set up um, churches with pictures of what they've discovered, and the mayors can come out and tell you exactly what's happened. If you go to Ukrainian train stations, there are displays about the refugees, um, really advanced communications so the world can understand exactly what's going on there and react appropriately to it in a way that we just haven't seen. Um, and that level of communication and then that level of technology, and it's really, um, to me, what, what I think um, we were looking at very closely as this war started was, uh, was Russia going to be able to use systems of misinformation, um, and, and certainly they've used that on their own population, but the Ukrainian population was very resilient um, given what happened in 2014. And I think, you know, those of us who... who they learned from that, essentially. They learned yeah. from that so that the Russian misinformation, um, not only um, were their technological advances helpful in defeating some of the Russian programs, but also... Um, the population did not believe the Russian misinformation um, because, of, uh, because of their experiences in 2014 and because they um, had such a desire and a, such a unity of purpose. And, you know, as you went there um, in the time leading up to the war, the, the most, you know, the, the area where um, I think many of us feel like, could there have been a means of deterring Russia? Because the most frustrating thing was just the total miscalculation of Putin going into this war. The, just on every level, thinking that if you spoke Russian, that you know suddenly you were going to rise up and somehow join the troops, or that you wanted to be um, Russian, the, um, the use of force and, and the will to fight of the people that... Um, Putin has sent to Ukraine, um, or lack of will thereof, and, and then the deep, deep fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people. And, um, you know, some people say sort of tongue in cheek, we all thought that Russia was the second most powerful military in the world, and then we found it was the second most powerful military in Ukraine. Um, <laughs> yes, and, exactly. You know, it's, it's really just that the amount of miscalculations, and, and I think the final one being that democracies of the world simply would not hold together in the face of Russian aggression. Well, Marta, let's, let's come to Russia, and let's come to this idea. I mean, for me, I think the, the war in Ukraine and, and, and how Ukraine has mobilized itself in many ways is a bit like, you know, the story of David versus Goliath. So Russia has you know, they didn't understand the capacity that, of course, Ukraine would have. They've been, you know, surprised by them. Um, you know, these small countries using all of these new technologies to really outwit this traditional, um, you know, world power. But there's also, you know, we've seen Russia using technology um, in bad ways. There's a dark side technology, and they're actually using AI to survey people. Can you tell us a little bit more about the technology, the bad side of the technology that Russia is trying to employ. Sure, absolutely. I mean, so fundamentally, any technology that can be used by the good guys can also be used by the bad guys. Um, and really, some people say that you know technology really amplifies power. And um, for me, this really underscores why it's so important to build systems that are fundamentally secure from surveillance. Just to give you a very tangible sort of example from, from this invasion, um, Telegram is, mm -hmm. was widely used um, in, yes. in Russia and Ukraine. And what you've seen is Telegram turns out to actually not be a secure, um, encrypted yes. system. And so what you saw is, is widespread Russian surveillance of Telegram. Uh, Telegram is actually um, uh, developed by Russians. And um, what you've seen as a result is a huge uptick in both Russia and Ukraine 
of the use of actually secure and encrypted technologies like, for example, Signal. Signal, signal. yeah, Signal, exactly. And so I think what this, this, this invasion really underscores is the importance of making sure that these technologies can continue to exist. And that might sound obvious, but every day, we hear lawmakers somewhere in the world talking about we need to create backdoors to encryption. We need to be able to surveil because we're the good guys and we need to be able to you know, write backdoors into that technology so that we can do surveillance. But what they don't realize is that when you undermine encryption, you're undermining security for the entire system and you can't have the good guys using it either. So that's so you basically shouldn't do it at all then. So what you need to do is make sure that you don't undermine the ability of people to develop these fundamentally secure systems that are free from surveillance because that is the technology that is going to be used by the dissidents in Russia. That is the technology that is going to be used by the heroes in Ukraine. Exactly. Um, now, Sasha, I think you've also seen this today. Um, the EU Commission has dispersed the first tranche, I think it's 3 billion euros, of an 18 billion euro package, um, macrofinancial assistance package, to Ukraine. And they're going to use it. You know, the money is, of course, very essential, and it's going to be used for public services, things like your schools, your hospitals, um, pensions, etc. You know, if we're reimagining this digital space that Ukraine is obviously occupying now, um, we're would you like to see that money go? And then perhaps, Mikey, you could also um, pipe in as well. I'll be very honest. Uh, basically, all the Ukrainian budget now is being spent for the army. Yeah. Uh, so we cover all the costs. Uh, for you to understand the uh, prices for the rounds, for, I don't know, for artillery, rose up, up up to three or four times. So are the other like vehicles and stuff. So we're paying a lot of money now just to fight. So that's why the money that we're talking about from the EU and also from the, the last uh, supplemental, uh, the last aid package from the United States, which, which was $45 billion for nine months, uh, they're basically covering our uh, costs for pensions, for healthcare, for education. Those are direct budget financing. And uh, without those, we wouldn't be able to survive. Um, I know that there has been a lot of... Uh, have discussion especially with the Hungarians on this uh, on this last aid package and I know that sometimes I hear these questions especially from the United States is why do we get why do give, we give you twice more than the EU does but I'm also trying to remind I don't know congressmen or people in the United States that Europe is hosting uh, almost 7 million Ukrainians right now paying for their health care education and sometimes even helping them with the housing so if you calculate that there would be much more than the United States is basically providing in their support. And that, uh, that is why this is uh, crucial for us, because if we do not have those money, uh, we will go bankrupt, unfortunately. We won't be able to pay the pensions to pay our doctors, because so far we have been very good in paying our army and supporting our army, especially with our international donors and the United States, because the United States is the biggest donor in terms of weapons mm -hmm. and armor. But these billions are purely to help survive our population. And Mikey, is, is, is that how you see it as well? Whether it's the EU, it's the US, this is literally a case of helping Ukraine survive. It's not a case of helping it, you know, think for the future, for its future innovation, for the time being at least. Right, I, I, I don't have too much to add. Sasha laid it out very, very well. It's um, simply keeping the economy of Ukraine nominally running, keeping the day-to-day -day expenses uh, intact so that um, when this war comes to a conclusion, as the world community comes together to help rebuild Ukraine, we're not starting um, behind the, the starting blocks. We're starting at least with an intact economy. And as you heard about um, the currency in Ukraine, you know, USAID has been working for, for a long time now to get that money onto people's phones so that they can go to the grocery store, they can um, take care of their, you know, they can have their pensions, et cetera. Um, it's, it's really just to, to keep the bare minimum sort of intact so that we're ready to rebuild once the war is over. Okay, well, keeping that in mind then, a final question for you all, because we do have about two minutes left then. Um, Marta, I'll come to you first then. You know, as all of you are such change makers, Marta, you especially, what advice would you have to balance between all of these cutting edge technologies and the sort of old processes that we've had established historically? Yeah, absolutely. 
You know, I think fundamentally when you think about what these new technologies are doing, um, it, is, it is so unlike what was what was around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I think we're really just starting to see how this can play out, not just for us in our day-to-day -day lives, but also how this can play out, I mean, in Ukraine. It's been such an incredible thing to see. Um, we didn't touch on it, but for example, the IT army of Ukraine yes. pop yes. up within awesome. hours. Glad you mentioned Yeah, that. I mean, yeah. unbelievable to see how this technology can be used. And so I think it's so important for us to keep in mind that we can't even imagine how this technology can be used. And so it's so important for us to ensure that we enable the innovation to continue to thrive. Mikey, your thoughts? This is such a loaded question for me because um, we have these fantastic new technologies that are, are amazing and for civil liberties, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm concerned about surveillance states across um, the world led by China, but certainly um, training um, authoritarian figures across the world and how to develop their own surveillance state in their nation. The maximum um, effects, yes. Yes, exactly. So, so making sure we have technology to guard against that. But then I also, uh, I, you know, I, I think of, I have my um, in-laws living near me and I have my children. Mm. And those are two areas where I think we need to, as we move into new technologies, be incredibly thoughtful. Um, I, I will tell you, like many parents during COVID, my children were being homeschooled and all screen and you had time a limits. Fantastic time with them, of course. Oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> you're let, you know, it's amazing I'm still here today. Um, and I say, you know, I'll say, oh, homeschooling was awful. And then my youngest is like, you weren't homeschooling me. My teacher was homeschooling me. I was like, I did enough. Um, but, um, you know, to to see them now after COVID, sort of these screen limit times just went up in the air. The amount of screen time our kids are getting is far too much. Understanding all of the algorithms that suck them into all of the different things they're doing online and then seeing them maybe, you know, when you take their phone away, how much better they're engaging with their friends and stuff. So really being careful about the new technologies, I think for our youth is incredibly important. And then for older people, because we've seen again after COVID, this isolation of older people. And how do we make sure that the new technologies aren't so disruptive that they cannot still engage in society? So I think we have this huge benefit globally and how we fight for freedom and civil liberties and civil rights. And yet we also have these, these important areas that I think are going really under addressed right now as we move into a new technological future. Okay, um, Sasha, we're actually running out of time. I can see my floor manager giving me an end sign. No worries. Um, so, but listen, ladies, it's been such a pleasure. I think you can all say Slava Ukraini. And guys, I hope everyone here has um, enjoyed this fantastic panel with these three ladies. So please give them a warm applause. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, thank you guys. That was great. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much.